Bouncing ball took some good bounces and took some bad bounces for this team, to be sure. But through it all, there was one constant. The man in the middle, number 33, Patrick Ewing. The next big man became a true superstar in every sense of the word last season. He played the way everyone had dreamt he would since the Knicks hit the jackpot in the NBA lottery five years ago. The second pick in the 1985 NBA draft goes to the Indiana Pacers. Patrick was truly the man on the Knicks. First-year coach Stu Jackson saw to it that the offense revolved around Patrick. The result? Patrick notched up incredible numbers on a nightly basis. He became a virtual scoring machine and averaging 28.6 points a game. Ewing increased his average by nearly six points over his previous best as he finished third in the NBA in scoring. Along the way, Ewing notched a career-high 51 points in a losing cause against the Boston Celtics, becoming only the fourth player in Knickerbocker history to record a 50-point performance. In addition, there were 10 occasions in which he scored in the 40s, compared to only six in his four prior NBA seasons. He totaled in the 30s in 24 other games. In the process, Ewing surpassed a club scoring milestone that had stood for nearly 30 years. That mark belonged to Richie Guerin, who set it during the 1961-62 season, when he amassed 2,303 points. It lasted until the next to last game of the season, but early in the first quarter against the Atlanta Hawks, Patrick Ewing made New York sports history. Gerald Wilkins rejected. Here's Ewing. Yes. So Patrick Ewing has become number one in the Nick record book. He had just passed by Richie Guerin for the individual season scoring record, 2,304 for Ewing. Patrick, you've had an outstanding young career so far. And uh, I'm very proud uh, of my record, uh, and I'm very proud of the way you handled yourself and the way you broke my record. Scoring, however, was only the most notable of Ewing's many contributions. For the first time in his career, Ewing averaged in double figures in rebounding with just under 11 boards a game. In two incredible performances, Ewing hit the 40-20 mark. Early in the season, Ewing destroyed the Golden State Warriors with 44 points and a career-high 24 rebounds. In January, he ravaged the Los Angeles Clippers with 44 points and 22 rebounds. The beast, as he is known by his teammates, was also a tower on defense, blocking a career-high 327 shots. To demonstrate what an incredible all-around performer Ewing has become, just refer back to last year's NBA leaderboard. Ewing was the only player in the league to finish in the top 10 in scoring, rebounding, block shots, and field goal percentage. Ewing's performance was rewarded when he was elected to start for the Eastern Conference in the NBA All-Star Game. Ewing showed the fans that they had made the right decision as he totaled 12 points, 10 rebounds, and 5 blocked shots in helping the East to a 130-113 victory. His play moved Kevin McHale to say he felt Ewing deserved to be the game's MVP, and many felt he deserved serious consideration for the NBA's 1990 Most Valuable Player Award. Both trophies, however, went to the Lakers' Magic Johnson. You know, I thought uh, I had a, a great shot of winning it last year, but um, unfortunately, I didn't. You know, they gave it to Magic. I think, you know, he deserved it. I don't even, I'm not even, I don't even want to be considered about it. <laughs> Perhaps more important than any of Ewing's accomplishments was his constant drive and desire to win. Ewing was truly the shining star for the New York Knicks all season long. There were other high points for the Knicks, among them the terrific start the team began the season with under first-year head coach Stu Jackson. The Knicks won the first 12 games at the Garden, a team record for consecutive victories at home to begin a season. Charles Oakley continued to serve as the chairman of the boards. The Knicks knew that Charles could be counted on for double figures and rebounds night in and night out. Unfortunately for Oakley, his run as the active NBA Ironman ended. Oakley's consecutive game streak of 323 was halted as a result of his suspension for fighting with Seattle's Xavier McDaniel. Kenny Walker was a bright spot for the Knicks, better known for his acrobatics above the rim. Sky improved his shooting tremendously, finishing the season with a career-high accuracy mark of 53%. 
Gerald Wilkins contributed some exceptional performances, none more thrilling than the finishing touch he applied to the Los Angeles Clippers early in the season. Strickland missing a chance to tie. He will have another opportunity. Maximum pressure on Rod Strickland right now. It's off, and a rebound is put in by Gerald Wilkins. 1.5, Reggie Williams is off, and the Knicks have stolen a game. The Knicks have stolen the game in Los Angeles. Again, Gerald Wilkins saves the day here in the L.A. Sports Arena. The season's most incredible ending, however, occurred at the Garden in a game against the Chicago Bulls. The score was tied with but one-tenth of a second remaining in the contest. This is virtually impossible now. Clock will start when someone touches the ball. One-tenth of a second, touch it, get it up. Jackson being looking for Ewing. Tucker launches it. It's gone. It's gone. Yes, it is possible to shoot with one-tenth of a second left. This amazing victory put the Knicks record at 26 and 10. But despite the euphoria surrounding Tucker's rule-changing miracle, the Knicks spent the remainder of the season playing inconsistent basketball. A number of problems were plaguing the squad, chiefly the situation surrounding the team's point guards. Mark Jackson entered the season out of shape, but was still included in the starting lineup. As the season progressed, Rod Strickland received increased playing time. As a result, Jackson grew unhappy about spending more time on the bench. However, in a game against Sacramento, Stu Jackson pulled Strickland for not getting back on defense. Strickland responded by kicking the coach's towel in anger. He then made it clear to everyone that he wanted to be traded. He was granted his request three weeks later when he was dealt to the San Antonio Spurs in exchange for veteran point guard Maurice Cheeks. Meanwhile, Mark Jackson continued to struggle and was permanently removed from the starting lineup with 13 games remaining in the regular season. Stu Jackson suffered through some difficult times, particularly in March, when the club compiled a dismal 4-12 and record. There was the embarrassing 20-point defeat in Minnesota against the expansion Timberwolves. A thrashing at home by the injury-plagued Milwaukee Bucks, led by none other than Brad Lohaus. Even Scott Skiles managed a triple-double in leading the first-year Orlando Magic to victory at the Garden. And to add injury to insult, Charles Oakley was lost for the season with a broken hand. Stu Jackson had reached the boiling point, and by season's end, the Knicks had surrendered their Atlantic Division title, finishing the regular season in third place. Little was expected of this team in the playoffs. The Boston Celtics hosted the first two games of the best of five opening round series and performed like a team ready to challenge for an NBA title. After a relatively easy 116-105 victory in game one, the Celtics thoroughly embarrassed the Knicks in game two. They scored an NBA playoff record, 157 points, on the way to rounding New York by 28. The Knicks had been humiliated, and no one gave them the slightest chance to win even one game, much less take the series. The season was one loss away from being over for the New York Knicks. The towel-waving garden faithful were out in full force, determined to help prevent the Knicks from being eliminated. The Knicks battled to put themselves in position to win the game. Clinging to a one-point lead, the Knicks gave the crowd reason to explode. Out of 13 on the shot clock, 16 remaining fourth quarter. Knicks with a one-point lead. Out of seven on the shot clock. Now to five. Here's Walker. Yes! Oh, a big bucket for the unlikely shooter. A jump shot by Kenny Walker from the corner to give the Knicks a three-point lead. But it's not over. The Celtics still had one more opportunity and got the play and the shot they hoped for. But Larry Bird's three-point attempt missed, and the Knicks live to see another game. In game four, there would be no late-game theatrics. None were necessary. The Knicks paid the Celtics back for game two in a big way, destroying the Celts 135-108. to Patrick Ewing set the tone early, scoring 10 points before the game was even three minutes old. He finished with 44, shooting 18 for 24 from the field. 
The Knicks made this veteran Celtic team look very old and very tired. New York thoroughly enjoyed running the Celtics ragged. They redeemed themselves, giving the Celtics a blowout of their own to ponder. This time, it was the Celtics who were humiliated. The Knicks' reward for their efforts was a trip back to Boston Garden. Only Trent Tucker and assistant coach Ernie Grunfeld played for the Knicks in 1984, the year the Knicks recorded their last victory in this hallowed Boston sports institution. In the six years that followed, the Knicks would try and fail to win an incredible 26 times. The Celtics began this one as if number 27 would be a mere formality. Larry Legend hit for 13 first quarter points and the garden was rocking. But the Knicks used a 13 to nothing run and a strong effort from Charles Oakley to trail by just four at the half. In the third quarter, the Celtics again pushed their lead up to 10, but the Knicks would not go away. Maurice Cheeks, who would play every minute of this game, was spectacular. He combined with Patrick Ewing for 25 points in the quarter, which saw the Knicks connect on 14 of their 18 shots. New York carried a four-point lead into the final period. Dennis Johnson pulled the Celtics to within one early in the fourth, and Celtics fans had the feeling that it was time for the Leprechauns to dance, but the Knicks hung tough. Charles was completely in charge underneath, and when Trent Tucker's key steal led to a fast break, the Knicks were up by six. Still the Celtics kept the pressure on when Dennis Johnson brought the Celts to within two, 99-97. Soon after, an incredible set of events occurred. Larry Bird, who would later claim that he jumped too high, missed a dunk, and Cheek scored on the other end. Following another Cheeks bucket, Johnny Newman then connected on a three-pointer to put the Knicks up 110-101 with under three minutes remaining. The Celtics knew they were through when Patrick Ewing hoisted a three-pointer from the corner. The Knicks had exercised their garden ghosts. The streak was over. New York had become only the second team in NBA history to escape from a 2-0 deficit and accomplished what everyone thought would be impossible. From the moment training camp broke in October of 1989, the Knicks faced the question, is this team of championship caliber? The regular season didn't clarify much, but the emotional victory over the Celtics and some saying, well, maybe. And then came the Detroit Pistons, a lightning fast five game series and a reminder to the Knickerbockers that there was still a lot of work to be done. the new renovated Nick dressing room here at Madison Square Garden. Of course, the Knicks had to go through an awful lot before they could get home. This NBA preseason for the Knickerbockers featured a lot more pressure than a normal NBA preseason. That's because the Knicks had to uphold the integrity of the NBA in traveling over to Spain to be a participant in the McDonald's Open. Marv Albert was there. The Knicks arrived in Spain after just six days of practice. Finding themselves 4,000 miles away from their purchased New York training site was hardly the ideal way to begin the season. Despite arriving as weary travelers, the Knicks were excited about being in Barcelona. NBA basketball has expanded its popularity to great heights on the international scene, and the stars of the league have become household names throughout Europe. While the Knicks found the people in Spain to be surprisingly knowledgeable about basketball, many still stared in amazement at this rather tall group of Americans. A lot of guys look up and say, like, you haven't seen nobody's tall in a while. Uh, it's strange, but, uh, you know, they're friendly. You know, a lot of us don't, you know, only speak America, but um, we can out point across. Pantomime seemed to be the method of communication in vogue when ordering lunch on a trip to a local McDonald's. In the evening hours, the Knicks were greeted like royalty. They were given special treatment reserved for visiting dignitaries. I'm sure that you're going to enjoy yourself. I, I know that the city's going to enjoy you. <laughs> <laughs> so you might as well make it mutual. Oh, we, we're in. She's we doing a little bit of shopping. A little bit of shopping? <laughs> only a little bit. <laughs> Come on, give her the credit card and cut it out. If you've only been doing a little bit of shopping, I'll talk to you. I'll brief you. <laughs> 
Shopping was definitely the leisure sport of choice for players as well as their wives. I think they're great, but the right. sleeves are kind of short. This is pretty loud, man. This is a pretty loud little jacket. I hope that's an eye there, not a one. one. <laughs> anything over $200, that's true. No, anything under $200, really. Mm. Well, then they have some socks over there. 150. Oh, gracias. What was it? Yes, while enjoying their many diversions, the Knicks did not hide the fact that they were feeling pressure regarding the upcoming tournament. I'd be kidding you if I, if I didn't feel any added pressure. The NBA has never uh, lost a game internationally. And my goal is to make sure that the New York Knickerbockers are not the first. The unexpected came perilously close to happening in the opener against the Italian champions, Scavellini. Led by former NBA players Darren Day and Darwin Cook, the Knicks were on the verge of relinquishing the NBA's superiority. They found themselves trailing by three with time running out when in dramatic fashion, Gerald Wilkins connected on a three-pointer with eight seconds remaining to send the game into overtime. The Knicks barely hung on, escaping with a 119-115 victory. They had an easier time of it in the championship game against Pop 84 of Yugoslavia, the reigning European champions. While their highly regarded Tony Kukoc put on an impressive performance, the Knicks were simply more talented. They left with a relatively easy victory and the McDonald's open title. So for the Knicks, the 4,000 mile journey away from home is now concluded. But with the McDonald's open tournament here in Barcelona now over, it is back to preparing for normal NBA competition. The trip to Barcelona was only part of a grueling preseason for the New York Knicks. When we come back, Bruce Beck will offer a preseason prospectus on the New York Knickerbockers. We'll be right back. Home of the New York Knicks, Madison Square Garden underwent a major renovation. From the huge new scoreboard, which dominates above center court, to the beautiful club suites, which dominate on the upper level of Madison Square Garden, you'll notice them the moment you come in. But on that first trip to the Garden, if you look here to the Knicks bench for major renovations, you won't find any. Because aside from signing their top draft pick, renovation was not an operative word for the Knicks this past offseason. Bruce Beck has more from the training camp of the Knicks at Purchase New York. at the line. Sometimes you don't have a, ch a choice of who to foul, but here's the two Hoyas at half court, Thompson and Edwards. Thompson runs up, gets it back to Bryant. Dwayne is free. He gets the foul. And uses five or six seconds. They were trying to give it right away. St. John's weren't able to. But they got it right back to Dwayne Bryant, 71% free throw shooter. And again, if you're Georgetown, you're saying, look, if there's a miss on the front end, tip it back. And St. John's has to be sure to squeeze, not to permit the offensive rebound. Bryant is one for two from the strike. The Hoyas have not scored in the last 246 since taking that six-point lead off the play made by that man, Alonzo Morning. Louis 
Walks it for Ivy. Takes it on. For three. Boo has got it again. Tillman bringing it up. to the magic of Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena, the stage upon which some of history's greatest athletes have performed. And tonight, college basketball takes center stage. It's act number two, Syracuse against St. John. Now, the situation, as we said, Syracuse with no timeouts. Let's say the Redmen hit both of these right here and it becomes a five-point ball game. You come down if you're Syracuse, do you go for three again, or do you take it inside for the two? I think you go for a good quick shot, but with the players out there, you, you almost know they're going to be looking for the three. But I don't think it's necessary. If you can get a good quick shot because of the foul situation, take it inside, maybe try to get the conventional three in addition to maybe stopping the clock because if the ball goes through the hoop, the clock doesn't stop like it does in the NBA. Stalin and that could do it as Duke can and gets four points very quickly. McCorkle rattles it in and out. Edwards on the follow with now 11 seconds left and St. John is about to pick up the victory as this would have just thrown high in the air. Ellis can't get it. So Syracuse falls to 23 and 4. St. John's 9 and 6 in the conference as they won it 77 72. John, what a night in the garden. Absolutely, Ron and Clark. Those streaks in the first half setting the stage. But the Redmen hang on and pull out the five-point victory. Well, he wasn't able to pull off any kind of a trade to help this club. Uh, he's in the middle of this Mark Jackson fiasco. And most of all, you take a look at the standings, you can figure it out. We all knew it was coming. The only question really was when. The answer does come this morning. Al Bianchi relieved of his duties as vice president and general manager of the Knicks. One facet of a major shakeup in the Madison Square Garden sports group. MSG president Dick uh, Evans announces that Jack Diller on the left here, who ran both the Knicks and the Rangers, will now focus solely on the Rangers. And that the new man in charge of the Knicks is 35-year-old David Checkett, the former GM of the Utah Jazz. Well, we have to have patience a little bit, I think. I think we'll have to show some patience. But uh, I believe things will be very good. I expect the best. I, I come in expecting only the best. Dave, what about John McLeod? What will he have to do to, to prove himself to you that he belongs in that coach's position? Well, you know, John has enough pressure without me saying, you know, perform or else. He knows what's on the line here. This is a very tough league to win in. I've always been impressed with him. So he's got my respect going in, and uh, I'm sure he'll keep that. Two seasons ago, this franchise was on the verge of breaking through to the league's upper echelon. Today, at five games under 500, they're fighting for a spot in the playoffs. Reaction from Bianchi's good friend and head coach John McLeod late this afternoon. And I feel badly for Al as far as myself is concerned. Uh, we are going in a positive direction with the Knicks right now, and that's the thing we want to continue to do. Now, we should tell you that Checkets will be hiring a vice president for player personnel. 
but all the major decisions, trades, contracts, etc., will be Checkett's responsibility. Tells me his first priority is to nail down a long-term deal for Patrick Ewing. Ironically, Bianchi's firing comes with the Knicks riding a four-game winning streak. Patrick Ewing outplays David Robinson. The Knicks, who trailed the Spurs 19-1 in the first, rallied a win. Gerald Wilkins, suddenly an all-star. Big hoop in the final minute, seals a 100-93 victory over a very good basketball team. Well, to the land of Big East wildness at the Garden today, we got some for you. The headline, Seton Hall in a thriller over Pitt, and top seed Syracuse stunned by Villanova. We start with the Hall Pirates. Trail Pitt by 13 in the first half, but they pounded inside. Second half, Anthony Avent. He scores 15 points in the final 12 minutes. It's anybody's ball game. Crucial sequence here. Less than 15 seconds to go. Bobby Martin strong to the hoop. No good, but Brian Shorter, terrific tip, and Pittsburgh leads 69-68. 10 seconds to go. The Pirates, a final chance. Oliver Taylor with the basketball. Clock ticking down. Do something, man. Do something. Down to three. Dives down, Oliver Taylor on the driving layup, scores down the lane. The game is over. Even if I didn't make it or if I turned the ball over, the criticism, all the stuff comes with it. Either you do it or you don't do it. And I, fortunately enough, I was experienced enough. I'm a senior. I'm happy, and I'm glad it went, it went through. No, I know, kid. The other quarterfinal, Roly Massimino, the game face on. Billy Owens, the jam for Syracuse. Cues would lead by 13 with nine and a half minutes to go. But Nova gets hot. Chris Walker, long-range bomb, gets it down. 68 all, a minute and 15 to go. Rowley says, come on, boys. 4.7 seconds left. Hughes down two. Davy Johnson, a chance to play hero, but not today. 70-68, Villanova, second time this year. Rowley's guys have upset the Orange. The Cats play the Hall in the semis. Now, the madness will continue tonight. Be hard-pressed to beat today's games, though, huh? 7 o'clock, the Redmen meet Providence, followed by UConn versus Georgetown. Well, a tough night for the Rangers in Quebec City last night. Not only did the Rangers lose to the worst team in all of hockey, they also... You know, they made the most of their first ever trip to the Big East Basketball Tournament Finals at the Garden today. Following two previous last-second victories, the Pirates just took it today to the Georgetown Hoyas. 74-62 to the final, garnering their first ever Big East title. First half, Anthony Avon, a man with foul problems early on in the tourney. Today, working against the Kemi Matumbo, 15 points rose to the occasion. Seton Hall up by one at the half, starting up the second half. Alonzo Mourning from outside. He had 22 points. That gave Georgetown its first lead of the game. And that had P.J. Carlissimo looking for an extra hand, if you will. Oliver Taylor, the tournament's MVP, did his part. Here, twisting for two of his 15 points for an eight-point advantage. And the Hoyas saw the game getting away, and a little frustration was vented here on Terry DeHare. Right into the cameraman on the floor. Now, now boys, let's keep it under control. Let's get back to basketball. They did. Time to beat the press. Pirates do it. Arturus Karnishevas slams it home. Is everybody happy? Well, not quite yet. Brian Caver puts some sweet icing on the Big East cake with a steal and a slam. Seton Hall hands Georgetown its first loss in seven Big East final tries. Pirates get their first win in their first try, 74-62. In Charlotte. Tar Hill fans all afire. Seven strikes, one. Six remaining. One point lead for Bishop Lachlan. We'll be back. 39 seconds left. And it's a one point lead for Bishop Lachlan. And here's the big bucket. It's a great pass inside to Riddick, who finally gets it. Dog jump of the fall. A steal by Antigua. Bishop Lachlan with 29 seconds to play. It is 68 to 67. Antigua well followed the missed shot. He's gotten a bundle of offensive rebounds this evening. None bigger than this one. It's a pass. The shot is missing. Sorry, Antigua missed the shot. 